Good morning, good morning, and welcome to this edition of Fahrenheit on 104.1. Thank you for choosing 104.1 on Power FM, where it's all about love. My name is Timothy Nyangweso. Today uh, marks a day when uh, we lost some people here in Lugogo. So our hearts and uh, minds go out to them and their families, even in this time as we commemorate that. But also we thank God that uh, we're still alive and nothing has happened yet. Uh, today on the show, we're going to be looking at things that are nation building. Uh, we have a guest that is going to be explaining to us what his message is. How do we improve this country? How do we put more money in your pockets? And how is that practical for an ordinary man? Do you have the mindset to be able to do that? But also, even as we look at that, we're going to constructively discuss the future of this country. We're going to be discussing land, budgets, debts, a balance of trade, a GDP, uh, the tax regiment, corruption, and all these things are things we're going to be able to discuss here. And my guest to be able to put to help us put this in perspective constructively is none other than uh, I have engineer Joseph Cabaleta. I found out your other name is Chiza, uh, presidential aspirant 2021. Joseph, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. I know you must have had a very hectic week or a hectic two weeks. Well, uh, a hectic one and a half weeks <laughs> since when is the last week. I hope uh, even as we discuss these things that uh, concern our nation, I'm able to get the energy out of you. I want to start on a lighter note, uh, the sports side of it all. Uh, Man City, Liverpool, those two have already been decided. Position three and four, who are you hoping is going to take it? Um, uh, I don't know. I, I, don't, I, I don't want to ruin any votes for myself. But the thing is, I hope Manchester United does not qualify for the Champions League <laughs> for the simple reason that I don't like them. But that's just sports. Uh, so don't take it personal. I've never really liked them. Um, uh, so I'm hoping, like uh, Leicester and Chelsea, take the the third, you know the other two positions for the Champions League. For the Champions League, I'm uh, hoping. Uh, to all Man U fans, including uh, myself, uh, <laughs> we are not happy with this message. Uh, no, but that's the thing, you know. Uh, but you know, I, I hope they are mature enough to understand that um, you know football is full of all these tribal sentiments. You yes, know? that's true. And so on. So uh, I have some of my own. I have issues where I fall. And uh, I've never really liked Manchester United, to be honest. <laughs> and, and, and everybody who had me here on Power FM, on uh, you know, yes, on Touchdown, knows that. So they knows that they know that about me. But I'm fair, and uh, yeah, and they are. Uh, I am fair. Okay, mm. let me throw one more. Mm. Madrid and uh, um, Barcelona are neck to neck on who wins the La Liga. Mm. Who is your money on? Um, I think Madrid will win it. Although I, I support Barcelona, I prefer Barcelona would win it. Why are you saying Madrid will win it? No, because they have form. They have won, I think, seven straight. Yes. And um, uh, Barcelona a bit stuttering. Mm. And they are on and off. And I don't think they have um, a good manager. And uh, I think Madrid now have a manager who understands the club. So I'm thinking that uh, they, they want, this is the one thing that Zidane wants, the league. Mm. Because he won three straight Champions Leagues. I think this is now, I, I think they really are in pole position to win it, Real Madrid. Okay, let's dig into the politics. Uh, Cabaleta, you are standing for the presidency come 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, you are interested in financial liberty of this country. Mm -hmm. What do you have to offer Ugandans? Exactly that, as you mentioned it. Uh, what I have to offer them is a government that uh, facilitates their dreams to actually uh, liberate themselves financially. Now, the thing is, um, the government creates an environment, mm -hmm. an enabling environment. Yes. And Ugandans have the innovation. They have the business acumen. They have so many things going for them mm. um, for, for, for them to be able to get themselves out of the doldrums in which they find themselves right now. Unfortunately, uh, it's not that easy when you look even at the legislation that is there, mm. when you look at the tax regime, when you look at the monopoly by a few people yes. uh, of all the businesses that actually have um, uh, you know, an influx of money and so many of the other things that are stuck against um, uh, the average Ugandan who is out there, who is gifted by God in areas of business and, uh, you know, innovation and things like that to come out and do anything of any value whatsoever. So that's where the problem is. Um, the problem is there is no enabling environment. Okay. It is not there. Actually, more, worse than having no enabling environment, they have an actively disenabling environment. They have a government that uh, deliberately sets out uh, to frustrate the dreams of a majority of its population. Now, um, and we've been kind of uh, in denial of that for so long mm. until so many people have woken up to the fact that uh, you only have to get to a certain level 
And then you'll have all these people, you know, swarming around you, finding out why did you do this? What are you doing? Where are you getting this thing from? And they will pull the carpet from under your feet. And uh, that, that has happened to so many people that I know personally. I, I want you to really, for a layman Ugandan, for an ordinary Ugandan, what is financial liberty? What, what do you mean by this? Break it down, unpackage it for us so that we can be able to understand it in small bits and pieces. Actually, for the most part, it's the most... It's the easiest thing to understand mm. because you see what happens unless you are a hand to mouth person. Mm -hmm. Anybody who has stepped out to try to do anything that is beyond hand to mouth to acquire anything in form of property knows all the you know the war, you know the hurdles that have been placed in front of them, mm. and those hurdles are and, and if they are not there, they will be created, okay, mm. um, immediately. For instance, I have a friend of mine who is in who is in film. And he told me that because now there's been a lot of messaging going out through videos. Yes. Okay, people go and shoot a video and uh, they put it out there on social media and it moves. I did one myself on, you know, or, uh, the economic civil war and it went places and reached places that I didn't even know it could get. Now there is a law suddenly that is being formulated to make sure that you have to inform people what you're doing and do this. And, they, and that's how they do. They f get, get laws to stifle everybody. Mm. Now, that's a new thing because now they are entering into film. Uh, you have to pay this amount of money to film anything. Um, to, then you have to inform people what you're filming, what the purpose is and all that. And then they give all, a whole litany of laws you have to follow, which eventually is aimed at killing the whole, you know, um, um, what should I say, burgeoning, mm. or, you know, film industry. Um, and by film, I don't necessarily mean, you know, those kind of films. I mean, just, you know, communicating through, um, you know, video, through and, video. And so, so, and all these things come up even in financial, mm. you know, in, in, in finances. Um, uh, when a business comes up, which suddenly, you know, you have, uh, is making profits, is making a lot of profits. Mm. Um, uh, they'll first of all come, of course, uh, with tax, which is okay because uh, everybody has to pay tax. But then after that, they will come with the aim of trying to take it away from you, depending on how much money it's making, and then personalize it. And then they will even come up with laws, um, uh, which they will call regulation, mm -hmm. which actually are intended at taking it away from a certain caliber of people and giving it to the same people who have the right to be making profit in this country. So that's how, and everybody, you go downtown, anybody who understands the language I'm speaking and who has been involved by understanding the language I'm speaking, I mean, who understands English uh, and has been involved in any kind of business knows what I'm talking about. Okay. It is a very clear thing to everybody. You know you can only thrive within a very limited space and uh, just stay there. You know you're closed in a room, you have freedom within that room. But you cannot step out of that room. As soon as you step out, that's where these words come out. And that has really been the story of this country. Uh, Joseph, this morning, as uh, with my wife, and even as I was driving here and I was discussing, uh, I was talking to her, what do you think of Joseph's message and uh, financial inclusion and all these financial liberties and all that? And this is what she told me. Mm. She told me, I have lost faith mm. in this government. I have lost faith in this leadership. And she's like many others there. How are you going to return faith of the Ugandans in everything to believe in this country? Oh, now that is the question that actually hits, you know, the, the, the you know the, the, the bull's eye, so to speak, because that is there. Because what we've had and uh, what I have seen, when somebody gets into the op opposition in this country, they mm -hmm. expected to think a certain way, they expected to say a certain message, and that message is uh, of anger, of resentment, of bitterness, and all that. And they do it so well, and they sell that to the population. And then, the, but the thing is that um, uh, uh, that's an easy message to sell. You understand? Mm -hmm. Because it's easy to get somebody angry that's about true. something. You and all have to speak bad things about uh, someone else uh -huh, and get it there. And get them there. But then, that is not the emotion that is going to change people's lives. Mm -hmm. You understand? None of those emotions actually have the ability to change people's lives, because uh, and but they are easier emotions to embrace because they don't. They, they, they don't require anything of you as a person. Mm. So if I'm angry at Nyangweso, I just say, oh, Nyangweso is bad, is this, is this. It's easy for me to sit here and, you know, throw everything at you. Yes. Now, um, uh, what I came, when I, that's what I realized about those people. Everybody knows how bad, bad this government is. Mm. I don't think anybody needs to be convinced about that. The question is, what I, when I, when I went there and I realized that's all they want me to, to keep on lamenting about how bad this government is. Mm -hmm. I said, no, we have to move away from that. We have to move away to a place of now uh, an emotion of hope. Okay? Okay. And now that's that's the hardest thing to sell. It's easier to sell 
contraceptives in a convent <laughs> than it is to sell hope to Ugandans because they are so despondent, they are so discouraged, they are so. And when you speak, you see they want to believe what you're saying. Yes. But they dare not get themselves to a place of believing because they have been let down so many times. You understand? Yes. I'll use this, for instance, uh, using an example that everybody can relate with. Imagine there's this lady who has been in love before. She was let down. Then again, she was let down. And all the while, she's giving all her emotion. Mm. And, you know, every effort she has and all this. Then now, after five let downs, okay, then suddenly somebody comes. She gives up on marriage. She gives up on... Generally, she's, you know, it's easy to sell hate mm. or despondency to that person. or disappointment to that person mm. because you find them in a place where they are ready to receive all that. The experience... We, make, we are just basically throwing a pity party, uh-huh. getting firewood and turikurumbe. Uh-huh, that's the thing. Okay. Because their, their experience has prepared them to receive that emotion. Yes. So you come and say, well, now until... Let's say um, uh, a young, you know, good-looking man comes and finds her attractive and now comes and starts trying to talk, you know, um, love to her. And then he finds her in a very, very so- sorry state because she, she looks at him. She would want to believe what he's saying. What he's saying. But she has been let down too many times that it's a difficult thing mm. for her to lift herself up again. Yes. Now, that lady is Uganda. That's where we are right now because what we are saying. So the what, man is calculator. Uh, yes, what we are saying <laughs> right mm. now is not go and get up because we want to get to a place yes. where Museveni will have been um, a very sorry part of our history. Mm. And now what will get us there is not the message of you know this whole racking up people now because they already know the issues that we are facing. Yes, what will get us there is hope. That actually, we have a good country, we have a rich country, rich in resources, rich in everything. We can actually turn this country around in a very short time with good leadership and make this a country that everyone aspires to live in. Now, that is very possible. Now, that the question is, how easy is that a sell to the average Ugandan? Yes. Now, that is because you find, you, even I've been meeting some of my colleagues and they say, yeah, you talk good and you, you, you actually don't want to make, but I mean, we, we've had this one come and fail, we have this one come and fail, we have this one uh-huh. come and fail. What and makes, we need you to walk the talk now. Yes. No, what makes Kablita think that he's going to succeed? First of all, I need to get you, mm. before you even get to me, mm-hmm. I need to get you into a place of hope. Yes. Now, the Bible says, since I'm in a Christian station in Romans 5 5, that hope does not disappoint. Okay. Um, now, hope is a good place to be. But now, it is not an easy place to be because it requires an input from the other person. It's not like hate. It's not like saying, young so is fake, what, you know that. It mm-hmm. doesn't require any input from me. Yes. But now, if I am to hope, it requires an input for me to say, okay, I've had five bad relationships. Yes. But maybe this one is the good one. Maybe this one is the one that's going to work out. The, you, you require something about it to, for you to do yourself, mm. to lift yourself out of that place. And get yourself to a place where you can hope that actually, regardless of what we've been through as a nation, and we've been through a lot, we can actually turn this corner and make this a brilliant country. Now, that is the hope that I am selling. It is not the easiest thing because let me tell you, let me tell you how Museveni has managed this country for all these years. Anger is an easy emotion to manage. Mm. And he's a master at managing anger. Do you know how he does that? How? He finds a way of channeling it. For instance, after the 2016 elections, when there was a lot of anger because everybody perceived that he had cheated that election, and he had. Now, there was a lot of anger boiling, if you remember. Now, what he did, uh, and the MPs some are always falling uh, in his trap. So he goes and gets the members of parliament to increase their wages and, uh, you know, and, and pass all these, uh, buying cars and what, all these expensive... Then now suddenly the anger of the population turns away from the president where it really should be and is focused on parliament. You understand? Mm. Now you remember even the pe- people were calling them M pigs. You remember that? Yes. On social media. And even there were people who were arrested taking pigs, piglets to, to parliament. parliament. To parli- you remember mm. that? Yes. Now he had successfully channeled the anger away from himself to somebody else. Then he has done that all. You remember the COVID money? Mm. All the money. Which, then suddenly, MP is 20 million. Then all the public jumps up with anger. Now the anger is directed towards the MPs. Mm. Very easy. Now he's an expert at channeling anger away from him. Right now, there are LDUs killing people all over the place. And uh, he will let it happen because he, has a, he knows people are angry. So he needs a, a, a channel for that anger. You understand? Mm. It's like water clogged in your house where you have to build some channel to get it out. So... Now the anger is towards the LDUs, you know? And who you jump on LDUs, LDUs should go and what? But then 
the thing is uh LDUs are just a part of a bigger problem which we have to be solving and the mm. problem starts from the top now he's, he will play that game of channeling anger it will move from the police to um uh, you will bring a chiboko squad he, be, he has been doing that for so long you remember the time of kakoza mutade yes yeah he was he was a perfect person who would just go and absorb and he was used for that purpose absorb all the anger from the public ah kakoza mutade and what and then somehow Museveni has an easy right. And he's been doing that all his years, by the way. Now, the one emotion he cannot contain is hope. Because hope is what makes people rise up and demand for something. Now, when somebody starts seeing that there's some light out of the and some hope and everything, now that's what makes them rise up. Now, the reason it has been so difficult to make Ugandans lift themselves up and get excited about a, new, a change is because they're in a place of hopelessness. Now, hopelessness, ah, you know, nothing's going to happen. Lock yourself in the room and say, oh, let's just survive. If I can get anything to survive and so on. Until somebody comes and says, no, no, you don't have to survive. You can actually thrive. Now, if I, by the grace of God, can manage to get Ugandans in a place of hope, you'll see how easy this nation will turn around. Because the one emotion he cannot stand is hope. He has sold hopelessness for so long. And you see... Ah, they've discovered oil. People are excited. You'll find a way of killing that hope. And then the next thing, everybody is back to where they were. You know that. Then even Joseph, they, they, Joseph I, want, I want to come back to... Mm. Uh, and, and that's one of the, 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 the reasons we like... I like your message. Because it's hopeful. It's talking about money in, peop, uh, in people's pockets. Mm. Uh, it's talking about solutions of how to get people out of this. Mm. The vindictive message that is out there. Aren't Ugandans... Aren't Ugandans satisfied by just the poor institutions, how are you going to resurrect these institutions? They can't go to a hospital and get proper medical care. They can't go to an LC and not get bribery. There's a story on Al Jazeera that has just been running about the bribery both in the judiciary and at the police. Mm. How do you resurrect these institutions for Ugandans to believe? Now, uh, it has to start with resurrecting the people themselves and they themselves to be. Because you see people always think that make things good and we'll believe. No, that's not how it works. You understand mm. that as a, believe first of all believe that we can because it's a collective responsibility okay i might be at the forefront of championing this hope but it's a collective responsibility and i i when i speak there is something i hope to see out of ugandans i mm. hope there's certain thing i hope to see out of the it, rise up the rise up of mm. ugandans now when we do that and we start demanding for more you see that's when because um for instance let's look at uh, if you look at the way even this whole covid thing has op- gone around yes um, uh, the things people are demanding for, for instance, in Kenya, vis-a-vis in Uganda, you see that Ugandans think they, they have been put to a place of hopelessness. They cannot demand anything. Nobody is even going to demand the radios that the president talked about. Nobody is going to demand for the masks. Nobody is going to. Not that we ever thought he was going to give them. You see, eh? mm. he has put, put us in a place where he can promise we are going to go to Mars, and people will say, yeah, yeah, and you know. And the point is. Nobody takes him seriously. Mm. Nobody expects anything from their government. And that's not a good place to be. Now, imagine if you are in a, in a marriage and your wife does not expect anything of you. That's the end of the marriage. Because it's built on expectations, isn't yes. it? She expects something of you. You expect something of her. And that's how you have a mutual relationship. Now, imagine if she go to a place, ah, man, that one, he did this. Ah, what do you expect now? You know, I have, now that is the end of the relationship. Now, that is the problem we have find ourselves here. The things we are talking about building institutions. Isn't it, build, because, wait, wait, uh, building, isn't it because, Joseph, we Ugandans have expected mm. and the person we're expecting from, the government, the leadership, the mm. institutions, mm. there's nothing coming out of there. The, yes, but now we have to lift ourselves over and say that this, this government is coming to an end. But even if it does, until we lift ourselves up from where it has put us, we can go from one bad to another bad, which is what actually scares me as a Ugandan. Mm. Because we've seen countries which thought they had the worst until they got rid of the worst, and then they got something worse. worse, worse you know. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> that was meant to be a joke. Now, the, the, the thing is, we, we want, we really, the, it has to start with the people. <laughs> it has to start with the people. It is us. But where, Joseph, where, where, let me tell you. Joseph, where, let, me, where, let me put it this way. Mm. You have given a very good example of mm. a Ugandan who is in a, a dire situation. Mm. Joseph, I moved around during this COVID season. Mm. I was privileged to be able to move around. Mm. It was a dire situation. Mm. To a point where yesterday, I think, mm. the, a gentleman walked with his mattress and a pillow mm. to parliament, mm. saying they have chased me from the house. Mm. Ugandans are, so, are, are between a hard place between a hard place and a rock, mm. and they're wondering how to get out of this place. Mm. 
and your message is hopeful mm. how does it become tangible for them for me because there was a story of a young man who began a saloon and when it looked good you were a came and clamped taxes on it mm. how does it become tangible for me that i start to feed it in my pockets now first of all it has to start with a change of government because mm-hmm. we know we have a government that does not care about people like that so we have to first have a government that does care you understand because we have a government that loses a year 830 billion shillings mm-hmm. in tax holidays to foreigners whereas they will not even let somebody who has started a saloon to even have a one year tax holiday and they are giving tax holidays of 5 years 10 years to people who are not bringing any value whatsoever in our country it's different if they are actually doing something which we need as a country and we are not going to produce mm. on our own but some of these people are just speculators and traders like any other people now they will come they will get tax holidays ugandans doing similar things will not get those tax holidays and will have their systems clamp on them and i've said before we are the only family that treats the family that treats outsiders better than treats the people of the home the children of the home if you know what i'm saying so um so the key thing is we have to it has to start with a change of government but before but for us to get to the place of changing government we have to first get away from the place of sitting back you know you've seen in those things uh, you know usually in movies mm. um uh, you know movies have a way of dramatizing things uh, in real life in a certain way and this person is you know has been disappointed in something maybe and then they go lock themselves in a room somewhere then you know they just send for pizza after pizza and, <laughs> and, and all yes, the, a lot yes. of liquor mm. and what and then put on a lot of weight and they they actually stop um um Uh, but you know uh, having hope really mm. uh, or you've seen those things of biggest loser yes. or those programs of people who lose a lot of weight you know from let's say uh, uh, for 450 pounds eh, to no more weight what what's the first thing that they take in hope mm. because by the time you get to that stage you've lost hope so you just say ah what come what may so you eat all the burgers and so on now somebody comes and sells to them hope and then they start a process and that's how that's the process that leads to their healing now this is what we are talking about Bef- the, the the actual things we are of the financial inclusion of uh, uh, you know of, um uh, actually putting money in the hands of people mm. these are the, this is the easiest part it is actually the easiest part because it has been taken out using legislation i'll give you an example um i'll give you actually an example there was one time what was um okay i'll start with coffee mm uh coffee and you know people selling all this coffee and so on and as much as it has all this you know it's a back you know it used to be our thing those years it actually still earns a lot of money for this country that's true to 800 million uh USD um you know and they and they are about one of our biggest you know and uh, so people are planting coffee people are everything and selling coffee at very little you know at very small prices yes uh but still making some profit mm. but then somebody up there chooses to come and take over the business that is coffee and you you everyone knows him if i say him he's a brother of you know the person at the Let, let's keep the personality now, mm. now he comes so what do they do they put up a law you know regulation of the coffee industry the industry has been doing so they put up a law of regulation Now regulation means that all middlemen have to be registered and given licenses mm-hmm. to regulate they have all these good wordings what that means is only the past people whom they approve of will get the licenses now what that means is that the farmers who have been selling let's say a kilo of coffee at 4200 shillings now because they can only sell to one two three people end up selling the same kilo at 3000 shillings and they even they even made the law more punitive they said that if your land has been gazetted for coffee growing mm. because you wanted to grow coffee if you cut the trees there is a penalty of up to 2 years in that thing uh, in the original it has just been passed but i saw the one before mm. it was passed unless they changed that so now imagine you are in a scenario you have this piece of land you have coffee you cannot cut down the trees but you have to sell your coffee to somebody who is connected at a loss You understand what I'm mm. saying? Now that that's another industry going down the drain. I, now they have they have been doing that and they use legislation. So now people think it is rocket science. How are you going to do this? No, it's the easiest thing. There is a lot of legislation that has been put there to stifle people. Just remove the legislation for starters and see if those people down there all the Ugandans will not lift themselves out of this. Just when I they want, know that I, I want us to turn a bit to mm. something and get into the economy. Mm. In your view as a presidential aspirant mm. 
what three four sectors do you look at and say you know these are low hanging fruit we can turn these around in the shortest time possible to slap the gdp of this country to move to us to a middle income in, uh, country first of all um uh, the first thing i would do is um step one. Mm. have something closer close to um you know an even balance of trade okay because we have a very bad negative balance of trade in the excess of 3 billion even countries like burundi and malawi are better than us mm. in regard to balance of trade even if they are they are generally poorer than, poorer than we are uh so we have a terrible balance of trade why is that because um uh, you know we we import we, more than we export yeah and that's and that's because we, the first thing that comes to people's minds mm. when they see something nest, that we need is uh we go and import it mm. for instance um we can grow rice here but we are importing a lot of rice now for this for starters we start by saying no agricultural product should be imported here unless you can prove that in 2 or 3 years it's not good because why should we import rice Okay. Some man came here and was doing a planned, you know, a planned rice and all that. And do you know how many people were getting money from a planned rice until he was actually thrown out of that government because he was making people rich. So this is not rocket science. There is a will to make people poor. All we need is a will to make people rich. But now, just, just now, a person okay, like uh, uh, one of the restaurants I don't want to mention mm, in this country mm. directly imports Irish potatoes because they say the quality of Irish potatoes here have so much starch and they are not at their their grade. The question I put to you you're saying this is good agriculture is good it is pretty understandable it has 68 to 70% of uh, the population in agriculture mostly subsistence mm. how does that turn around people have been pushed to subsistence before this government came into power people were not doing subsistence and by the way let me tell you uh what the, the were taught in school are cash crops and food crops yes every crop now is a cash crop true because if you go to places somebody was telling me um it's a radio presenter like so if he comes from gomba mm. and he said he went there and they were buying beans at 4200 shillings a kilo mm. beans in kampala are cheaper why because certain people okay have gone and bought all the land there some of them have planted eucalyptus and so on so there is no land for people to plant beans so what makes beans not a cash crop the, the reason we are called that of course because the british wanted us to plant coffee tea and you know and mm-hmm. uh, cotton for their industries there because they needed those things for their industries but now food stuffs we are importing food stuff so everything is a cash crop now people have been pushed into subsistence farming because they have not seen um some kind of reward in actual and even some corporate people have tried they are going into farming you remember those yes, that yes, yes. at some time asks how many of them have made a profit out of it and it's not because they are not good farmers or not good businessmen it's just because there is no enabling environment i'll give you an example there's one i know whom i met at, in my home place in hoima he came for years used to stay abroad he came and planted a lot of maize now he ended up selling it because there are cartels even in <laughs> you know the produce thing there are cartels there are people on few people whom you have to sell the maize to now there was a time when kenya was thinking of getting maize for mexico imagine and what the president here telling people how to take advantages in the village of uh, opportunities in the ICT industry mm. yet kenya is importing maize from Mex- okay they eventually did not but they were planning to mm. now why is that that's because our maize was not well dried and why was it not well dried because people have to sell it to one person and you know when the, you, you don't dry the maize properly and mm. completely remove all the moisture it becomes very deadly even for health yes so they rejected it okay and uh, it's the same person you know who I was talking about the same person <laughs> so um, i'm not going to don't fear i'm not going to mention names eh? but they rejected it in kenya so he ends up selling it to prisons and you know um, uh, or whatever around here but we have the capacity to be a f- bread basket you go to all these East, uh, uh, countries cameroon equatorial guinea and what equatorial guinea has a lot of oil they import every food stuff every food stuff we have the ability to be a bread basket for these people we actually do, we have more than enough we are the only ones who can have two seasons in a year okay we ca- we have so many comparative advantages so many comparative advantages in that area now when we the problem that people have had is they do not they they the issue of market you plant your maize now when it comes to the marketing phase that's where you're eliminated because that's where you run into the cartels the cartels will tell you we are buying your maize at this loss if you do not sell it to us you're not going to sell it anywhere 
Joseph, let's, so you have let's, a choice of either eating your own maize or sending it to somebody at a loss. Fahrenheit, and my name is Timothy Nyangwe. So I'm here with Joseph Kabuleta, a uh, presidential aspirant. He's busy breaking down uh, which sectors are low-hanging food that we can be able to break down and see how to make quick returns. Someone asks a question here and says, quick question to Kabuleta. Since we are talking numbers, what does what does he think about the numbers in terms of votes for him that will come f- that will come through? Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, someone else sends in another question and says... Um, Quick one, to, uh, same question, asking about the numbers. Joseph, I want to turn to you, and uh, the quick question I want to ask you. The Electoral Commission has declared digital campaigning and all these things that will be happening. But one thing that I want to ask you, if your colleagues in the opposition, and I know they're not really your colleagues, but every presidential aspirant that is not the president, if they boycott the elections, will you also boycott the elections? There is no point in boycotting the elections. That would be a defeatist strategy, because what will happen is that... Uh, uh, the, the 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 president will just go and get some fake. He's done that before. You remember Nelson Ochegel, people who were you know um, mm. of politically understanding age in the early two thousands. He goes and creates some op- some opposition of his own. And when he wanted to change the system of this government, he created so many political parties around two thousand. Uh, just get parties because he wanted to over or defeat the existing parties, you know, which actually had some clout. So what he does is he creates um, a quorum. Of fake parties, so it's it's pointless. Uh, what um, uh, boycotting the elections? Nobody is going to do such a stupid thing. At least not I. So uh, digital, not digital. So you know, you, if they talk about transitional government uh, and also the state of emergency as to the constitution, if all these things are put into play, mm. what are you willing to do? I'm willing to stand and win. Now the thing is, um, I do hope. That uh, I was disappointed this week when Parliament came up and said they are okay with, uh, you know, with the, with the digital campaigns or the so-called mm. scientific election because we are challenging it in court. We still actually are yes. uh, challenging it in court. But also the NRM, the leading party, and come out and said that they also do not support uh, the digital campaigns because they know so many of the incumbents are going to lose using that. It's easier for the people who have been on the ground all along. There are, there are so many young, you know, aspirants, and you probably seen some of their posters, people who are two, three, four years out of university, yes. who have been down in those villages canvassing support mm. while these people were here changing the constitution to 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 to, to, to impose on us, you know, so whatever, and uh, this, you know, fake presidency and so on, and doing all these things, and uh, you know, st- st- COVID money and all that. There were people down there who were actually going house to house looking for votes. And now these people know these digital campaigns and they knew ordinarily how to get past that. They wait on election time, they just go and throw money here and there, do this, you know, buy their agents and what, do exactly what their boss does. Mm-hmm. And uh, then they win and come back. Uh, so, But now with these digital campaigns, those people who are actually on the ground, who have been on the ground all these years, have an advantage. So the NRM people are kind of scared that uh, the dig- digital campaigns might throw a lot of their you know formidable incumbents mm. out of parliament so they had kind they had supported the removal of it but then there's a small issue of uh they either declare a state of emergency or a state of war which cannot which can be declared by the president and if they do then uh the period uh after when the presidential election is supposed to be they would it would be the speaker of parliament yeah that's would be true de facto president and there's no way that um uh there's no way that Museven is going to let Joseph, that happen. Uh, so, we are going to be in a lot of confusion in all this. The last few weeks, uh, there was uh, a video that went around about mm. you and uh, Honorable Chagulani meeting. Mm. Do you believe in a coalition to be able to run this country? And also, if one of you is nominated to be the presidential candidate, mm. would you step aside to let this person run for this country? There is no chance that I'm stepping aside for anybody. It's not going to happen. It is not going to happen. First of all, and second, So that means you don't believe in the coalition? The coalition has not worked. The problem with Ugandans is you are the only people who think you do the same thing over and over again and get a different result. Coalitions have tried from they have tried making coalitions from 2001. There were there was a stro- as strong a co- there was a good chance of a coalition in 2001. Mm. But there were nine presidential candidates in that year. They tried in 2006 it failed. 2016 they tried the TDA, you remember. Mm-hmm. Eventually, people who are part of the TDA, Mbavazi runs and goes and says Museven is the best person for this. So not Mbavazi, sorry, my, my, my beg, beg your pardon. Mm. Bukenya, okay, runs out of TDA and ends up, ends up endorsing Museven. 
then others run and end up you know endorsing different people mao endorses uh Mama and Babazi, and so on and so forth. Eventually, it turned out to be Vesija was the main challenger to Museven. Uh, and there was no coalition. So there has not been any success at a coalition. And it, um, g- making a coalition right now with uh, the people who want change in Uganda oh, is uh, going to be as difficult as I don't know what. I said it before, it's uh, almost as difficult as hammering a peace deal between Israel and Palestine. Joseph, so many people have tried and failed. So I am not going down that path. You have given us very many examples, 2001, 2006, 2011, 2016, mm. and you've spoken of all those elections. Mm. But the one denominator in all these elections is mm. electoral violence. Mm. Uh, candidates have been bundled up, beaten, mm. thrown into jail. Uh, Bessiger was in jail in 2016 for after the elections for 47 days. Mm. It happened to um, Amam and Babazi. Mm. Are you sure you are ready for this wrath? that will take on this election, the beating and the imprisonment. You know what Jesus said, that uh, there was this man who went and started building a house without counting the cost, mm-hmm. and he stopped halfway, and uh, everybody laughed at him. Mm. I am not going to be that man. That's so you have counted the cost? Just know I'm not going to be that man. There is no, there, there is nothing he's going to bring on me that I'm not ready for, including death. Okay, there is, Because I know, I know him. So I don't just enter this thing with a head full of illusions. I know him. I have been in those t- torture chambers. My, I'm, not, I'm not talking fables. I've been there. So Joseph, I know. You have seen, uh, you've seen what has happened to uh, Namboze. You have happened, seen what has happened to Zake. What happened to Bobby Wine? At the cost of your family, you're willing to put your life down. I've told you I have counted the cost. Mm. And I've told you I've been there. I've not just seen what has happened to other people. I've seen what happened to me. Okay. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go to the institutions of government. Mm. Joseph, they, there is an allegation of the mafia. You've brought a new narrative today of uh, people that, a cartel that is there. These people are so entrenched in the institutions, in this country, and they run this country as it's alleged. Mm. How are you able to root out all this rot in this country to get it back to its glory that it deserves? The advantage we have is that um, there, are, there are so many Ugandans who are not going to let it go ahead. And the person at the top is going to be removed and uh, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Mm -hmm. Now, what we are going is we are going for the top because what he has wanted is to have people fighting beneath him. You know, we are going for the top. Mm -hmm. And when we strike the shepherd, the sheep will be scattered. The sheep are those mafia. They are all just a symptom. You know, people, we have to stop fighting symptoms. We have to go for the real cause of the problem. And the cause is at the top. And the person we are going to co- unseat is the person at the top. Okay? So that is what we are going to do. The, 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 this thing of, you know, how are we going? Those people, when the person at the top, you remember what happened to the Philistine when Goliath was slain? Mm. They fled. That's what is going to happen. These people are going to flee. The, minute, the minute the giant is slain, all the people will flee. Just Trust me. Let's, let's get to the administration. Mm. Uh, I don't know who your running mate is, and I don't know if you'd like to discuss that here, mm. but also the administration costs of this country are through the roof. Mm. We have 82 ministers. We're about, come the next election, we'll, ha- we'll have about 530 MPs. We have cows, we have RDCs, we have uh, uh, DISOs, GISOs. Just the administration cost on the taxpayer in this country is insane. How do you relieve that burden from us, the taxpayers? Oh, that's the easiest thing. First of all, um, uh, there are two things. What I was talking about when uh, you, you, that time, okay, you kind of, uh, you know, the, these are long things. Mm. But now this is the, 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 what I was talking about, the um, uh, kind of managing, you know, mm. our budget. Because right now we have a budget which is unmanageable. If a family ran a budget the way Uganda runs its budget, I can assure you that they would be in serious trouble very soon. They would file for bankruptcy and run to the hills sooner rather than later, or no, if not run to host, uh, be, be taken to prison. Because we have a budget where we're expecting to collect um, through all means of revenue, 21 point something trillion, trillion shillings. Yes. And yet we are expending 45.4 trillion, trillion shillings. shillings. Now the rest is going to come from God knows where. Of the 21 that we are expecting to collect, 12, of, almost 13 is going to go into paying interest for previous loans. Mm-hmm. Now that leaves just about seven or eight. And with yeah. the national debt that is skyrocketing uh, uh, towards fifty percent. Yes, um, uh, that that leaves about um, uh, that leaves about eight trillion left mm. of the money collected. 
Now, when you take off state house, classified expenditure, military expenditure, there's nothing left. Actually, we have more to, <laughs> that they need to borrow. Yeah, now, so what needs to be done, first of all, is to cut down the size of the public expenditure. And that mm. is not so difficult to do mm. because it's easy to cut down the sp- size of the public expenditure. And then also now increase the tax base, which is actually one of the things which is at the heart of everything. Because you see those traders downtown, mm. when you talk to them, the one thing that holds them down, more or less like somebody putting a foot on their head, is the tax burden that they have. And they have a huge tax burden in any business you do because this area of just, you know, um, a, a few square kilometers yes. in town, from here where we are at Watoto Church, going down here, accounts for a huge percentage of Uganda's GDP. Now, they are the ones who are squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. Now, the others, of course, pay when if you wear mobile, you know, mobile money, uh, you know, airtime tax and all that. But these are the people who are really, really squeezed. Mm. Now, the, but because we have 70% of Uganda who are not on the tax grid at all, they are totally informal. They are not on the tax grid. The people we talked about are... The farmers the and all the people in the yes, informal you can, sector. Do you know you can actually bring those farmers on the tax grid, all of them? What are you taxing on a farmer? The, the produce, the yes. value addition? No, the produce. Because here is what you do. And you do it in a way where it actually benefits them. Because what is their biggest problem? The reason you cannot tax them right now is because you're not adding an input. Yes. It's like milking a cow that you've not fed. Now, what do you add to them? What's their biggest problem? A farmer's biggest problem is finding market. Okay? So if you tell them that, okay, we are going to tell you plant vanilla, we can we, we have we found market for vanilla mm. somewhere out of the country. Now, that's what other countries do. You've heard of, uh, uh, you know, Trump hosting the Chinese president, and then he leaves and tweets that, you know, we've agreed the 300 billion uh, sale of soya bean, American soya bean to China. This, this is what actually real governments do, uh, creating market for their people. So now if you get those very same people and say that plant this crop, we'll, we'll actually get a market for you uh, at a rate where you will make a huge profit, but that profit is going to be taxable because we are going to have an input in making it easy. Now the farmers have no problem planting. Mm. They have a problem finding market. Now, that's where their government comes in and says, we can find for you that market. So if, uh, uh, if for instance, you plant this crop, uh, if you plant this coffee, I'll give one which is basic, but there are so many others which are a lot more profitable. Yes. If, for instance, we plant coffee, we'll give you coffee at 5,000, uh, you know, 5,000 a kilo, mm. shillings a kilo. That gives you good profit. Or let's say even 6,000. And 6, encourages 000. you to keep planting the coffee. Let's say even 6,000. Mm. Now, they have been selling it at 3,000. You give them more, okay? Because that's actually, you take out this middleman. Mm. Then you say, but of... That we are taking off a pay as you earn tax. It is still cheaper for them that way. It's still more profitable, rather, for them that way than what has been, where they are, all the money is going to middlemen. You understand? So you make them rich while actually bringing them on the tax grid. Now, that is 70% mm. of the population. Now, when you get taxes from all those people and bring them on the tax grid, then you can uh, lighten the burden on these people, these people downtown Chikubu and all that who are really, really suffering. Now, do you know what that does? That means that, and then you cut our public expenditure. So you go down from, move from up from the 45 trillion and what, and say how much of this can we actually not spend? Then you bring it down as much as possible as you increase this. I can tell you within a short time, we'll be able, and I can tell you this, within a short time, we shall be able to actually finance our own expenditures. Joseph, let me read these texts that have come in. Hi, Timothy. Please let Joseph uh, finish the economic issues of the low-hanging food. Joseph has uh, handled the economic skills. He knows how to handle the economic skills, and I like that. He's not an aspirant, but he brings life to these politics in this country. Someone else says, uh, Hi, Joseph. Would you adopt the Tanzania model of dealing with COVID? And also, (laughs) standing with opposition and uh, saying Palestine and Israel, I don't think that works well. But also, I think you have brought a freshness to the politics of this country. Uh, Those are the messages for now. Joseph, the question I want to put to you, we have too many multinationals in this country, and it's Mm. something you hinted on. Mm. And uh, after we're done with this, I hope you can be able to uh, expound on uh, the three, four sectors that can be Mm. resuscitated as low-hanging fruit. Mm. We have too many multinationals. We have only four local banks. Mm. The rest take the money out of this country. Telecom companies. Mm. Uh, Tax holidays, you touched that. The Ugandan 14.3% is still suffering in this area. 
these people are taking capital out of this country mm. how would you handle we uh zimbabwe was threatened by being taken the dam and uh, being taken by the chinese we have a lot of loans a lot of concessions 1800 megawatts of power that uh, we only use 21% joseph there's too much to handle on one plate how do you separate the there cabbages is, from let me tell you there's not too much to handle actually because like we've been put in this place so low we've been put so down that f- now how is having a lot of because what happens why is it that we are producing a lot more electricity mm-hmm. than we are distributing and why is it that even the excess electricity is costing us money to keep true you understand because of one thing the personalization of a country now the person who is you know you divide the electricity thing into the generating mm. and then the distributing and what so there's this person who is in the generating who goes and has the ear of the president who is the kamalavyo now mm. like the family whatever uh, semaka eh? and they tell him uh you know we have this this that that so you get a lot of issues uh you know so you get uh, the, the generating gets a lot of input and so they end up generating a lot more electricity than they can distribute now all these things can be solved very very easily with just using the brains of Ugandans which they have which are there there is no shortage of technocrats who can actually solve this problem given a good political environment there are people there even in government who have the brains who have you know, the know-how and so on so what they need is just a political environment where they can do this because now uh, what's the, fa- the first thing you talked about uh, the uh, the multinational company the multi- oh now that's a problem because we have an issue, and and I used to see this you've had the whole thing of foreign investment foreign investment yes. now um, i remember one time i was listening to uh, a speech by the president and he's saying um you know i went and told foreign investors you can come to uganda there is very cheap labor there is no minimum wage uh we will give you free land we will give you what and you can repatriate all of your profits i'm saying man <laughs> okay that is like the stupidest proposal you'll ever give it's like uh, the example that i i, I would give maybe that but it's like coming and saying you can come to my house cook your food you eat know eat it and go away eat eat eat, car, eat it and carry the leftovers <laughs> even as the people of the house uh, are, are starving, starving. Some, mm. i mean you, you how do you even explain that and how have even ugandans be bro- been brought to the point where you can even take that what is the benefit for ugandans so he says the investors are bringing jobs but they are bringing so many people first mm. of all and then they are giving very low skilled jobs with very very diminished you know uh, uh, remuneration yes mm. and then a lot of profits which they are all repatriating now I'll tell you if you went and started such a business let's say if you went and started a business that is very profitable in a country like uh, let's say south africa i doubt they would allow you to take more than 10% of your profits outside of their country that uh, you have gone too far mm. i i studied in india mm. every multinational had to employ 90% of the, the indians the locals and uh, they give you a time period on which they should be able to sit on the board mm. to be able to make decisions mm. but joseph uh, and, and and this is something now that i'll give you an example one of those multinationals uh-huh. i will not even mention names if you told them that now you can only repatriate 50% of your profits just 50 mm. which is actually a very generous offer mm. very few countries will even give you that uh, joseph absolute power corrupts yes the seven of 1986 if you saw them seven of 2020 uh-huh. i think they would fight mm. You, if you are president, mm. are we sure we're not going to have the calculator of 2021 looking at the calculator of 2040, and they want to fight? There's and how would you avoid that? There's not going to be a calculator of 2040 who is president. <laughs> Here is the point: when uh, when somebody, you know, and you you know, people don't read into things. When Museveni says he has been a freedom fighter for 50 years, and then you say it, what he says, no, no, I've been a freedom fighter. We fought Amin, we fought what, we fought colonialism, and so on. He's saying something, you understand? Now he's saying he did not become president by your vote. But now if Kabila becomes president the only way he can through a vote, then it is easy for the vote to take him out because it's the way he got there. But if but since I'm not going to become president through the barrel of the gun, I don't even know how to hold it then um that that would not be a problem all that will be solved once we get into the era of democracy where mm. you can elect somebody like me and i become president now that means i'm a servant of the people because um they are the ones who put me there that's why i'm here trying to convince them kableta uh, mm. uh one of the things uh, i also want to put to you mm. do you need to be president to di- to get, get us the financial liberty you were talking about absolutely absolutely there is no other place you can be and 
uh, and and the the, the 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 actually the vision that I have for this country mm. cannot be accomplished in any other position apart from president. That's why somebody asked me if you do not become president and they appointed you to be in some position, let's say prime minister. I said I would not take it because it would be pointless for me to be prime minister because I would have to be serving somebody's vision. I have my vision for this country and it's what I want to sell to the people of this country and they will vote me on basis of that vision. And thankfully, it is one which can be w- with, with actual deliverables. You promised us ABC so that you can actually pull out your red pen and start marking, has this happened, has this happened, has this happened? So it is not generalities like what you've had elsewhere. It is actual deliverables that we are promising here. So, the, and, and the only place I can sit and do that is the, the top seat. So you say the presidency is the only one. If yes. you do not get the presidency in 2021, mm. will you come back in 2026? I will get the presidency in 2021. <laughs> I am I'm, thinking 2021. Let, let's go back to the low-hanging fruit. Mm. You gave us one sector, agriculture. Yes. What other two, three sectors do you think we can resurrect to get this country into middle-income status, just like Tanzania or any other country? Um, tourism. Okay. Tourism. That's very, very low-hanging. That one, you, you, it can even hit your head when you're walking. Mm. Um, and it's there, and it's the kind of thing that actually. Um, that that money does not even go to specific people. It is the kind of money which goes to gener- general people, hotel owners, people here, that you know, people in all sorts of sectors. Yes. And uh, we have to improve the nature of our tourism mm. because I was seeing seventy five percent of the people who go to Kenya and Tanzania as tourists go there for holiday. Mm. That means they spend all probably about three weeks or so there spending money. Now, for us, that figure is 25% of the people who come here and say, well, I'm going for holiday in Uganda. Now, if we even improved that to 75%, would be very good, even before we start improving the numbers of the people who are coming. Mm. And the numbers have been increasing, but we need to market ourselves as a country. We've not done that quite well. Because um, uh, you go in all these places, people will know that, ah, the gorillas are in Rwanda, but they're actually in Uganda more than they are in Rwanda. But Rwanda has done a lot of the marketing, and very soon they will have a monopoly of that, and people will think that they actually are there. So it is all about marketing yourself. So tourism is the other low-hanging fruit, very low-hanging. You can actually eat it while standing without even plucking it. Um, and the others, the others, but I, I suspect we are not going to have enough time for us to expound on them. But the others which you can Im- instantly think about and um, that can change people's lives. Let, let's, let's talk about uh, the economy and uh, talk about BOU, central banks. Most of the banks we just suggested, four of them are, are mm. just local. Mm. The others are foreign. But also in the 80s or 90s where you and I grew up, the dollar was about 1,000. Uh, the dollar to the shilling was about 1,800. But everything in this country, once it goes up, it never comes down. Mm. Uh, how do you plan to bring our shilling to be able to be formidable against the dollar? No, all that best is based on balance of trade, mm. going in and going out. The, the, the shilling versus the dollar is just at the ultimate symptom. Okay. What brings it about negative or positive is something different. And it's all about what you're trading vis-a-vis what you're importing. Now, in an import culture like ours, where everything is imported, is imported you think about something which everybody wants is imported. I was shocked to see the amount of slippers, bathroom slippers we import from Kenya. Mm. Slippers. Butter. Uh, butter. Mm. Umoja. Mm. Uh, we import from Kenya. And I was like, surely can't swim slippers. I mean, slippers. And <laughs> we are sending them to DRC, South Sudan, and they are moving millions of dollars. Big money, mi- millions and millions of dollars of Sapato. First of all, because they are, you know, turn, high turnover. They get, you know, those people wear, wear them all over. You yes, know, yes. Grazing cattle and all that. So they wear out very fast. So they are always buying. Now I say, but surely can't we make that here? Do you know how much, ma- for instance, how much, we imp- how much garlic we import from China? Garlic? Garlic? Garlic can grow anywhere in Uganda. And it takes only four months for harvest. Four months. <laughs> so all the time we had from coronavirus, since China were no longer importing things, if somebody had planted so many, we would have... Enough garlic here. Even when they open the import, we say we no longer need garlic from China, but we are still importing. So Just, there are so uh, many uh, things. That... Unfortunately, we have run out of time, but I want to give you 30 seconds mm. to convince Ugandans why they need to go to that ballot and tick you. Now, especially the people who are listening to this kind of language, because they are the most apathetic. They are, uh, they are the ones who are like aloof, mm. is what I meant to say. There is a lot of aloofness among the elite Ugandans, mm. which I find very dis- disconcerting because... The, the people downtown have a lot of zeal and vigor, but mm. they actually do not even have an articulation, real, real, you know, articulation. Like, so we need the 
um, the elite people to stand up and stop being aloof and actually go and get themselves involved in politics. Okay. Um, and, and we're not even talking about elective politics. Like mm. I, because they might say I'm scared for my family, my wife. No, no, no. I'm just saying about going, talking to people, selling hope like we are and telling people we can actually go and change something um, at the ballot. Now, don't say how we failed to change it before. No, go and do it this time. We are selling hope. Thank you, Joseph Kableta. That was my guest, uh, presidential aspirant under the brand Rock. So I hope uh, you have been able to pick a few things there that will be able to make you decide on what you vote for. Uh, but also we'll end with this quote. Uh, if you can't see the forest from the trees, I don't know what you're looking for. God bless you and have a fabulous weekend.